Okay, it's a great honor to be here giving this talk. So what I, what I plan to talk about today is some aspects of off-shell string theory. In fact, uh, this will relate to some old problems in string theory from the late 80s, which uh, were never really completely uh, satisfactorily addressed, and I'll try to address some of them, hoping that we learn something new from these studies. So the plan is to first discuss why we want to discuss off-shell string theory. Okay. How do we proceed? And then in part three, I'll describe the progress so far. Okay. And this will be based on some work that I've done with two graduate students, Roji Payas at Allahabad, and Arnold Rudra, who is a student of Michael Green at Cambridge. So let me begin by motivating why we need off-shell string theory and what are the kinds of problems that we uh, want to address in the context of string perturbation theory. Okay. So here is the first reason. Okay. Now, we, are all, uh, we all believe that string amplitudes are supposed to compute on-shell S-matrix elements. But if we look at string amplitudes directly, this is so only for external states which do not suffer mass renormalization. And indeed, if we look at general external states, then what string amplitudes compute is what in a quantum field theory can be called truncated Green's function on classical mass shell. Okay. And here it is what it is. So imagine that you have a quantum field theory with some Green's function, momentum space Green's function, Gn, A1 to An at the external levels, external quantum numbers, K1 to Kn at the momenta. Okay. What string amplitudes compute is this Green's function multiplied by the inverse propagators for each of the external legs. Okay. And then in the limit when external legs are put on shell, but this on shell refers to tree level mass cell condition. Okay. And this is forced on us by conformal invariance. Okay. If we compare this with the S matrix element, which are given by the LSD procedure, okay, it's slightly different. First of all, in this product, you also have a factor of wave function normalization. And the tree level mass squares are replaced by the physical mass squares, okay, which are in turn determined by the poles of the two point Green's function. Okay. So you see that these two are not quite the same. Okay. And of, we also have to take the limit when the external momentum squares are equal to minus of the physical mass squares, not the tree level mass squares. Okay. So here I have displayed these two things again. Okay. Now, the effect of the wave function renormalization is not very hard to take care of. Okay, so if that was the only difference between these two formula, we could take care of this by looking at appropriate factorization properties. But the effect of the mass renormalization is more subtle. Okay. And because of this, we can say that the string amplitudes indeed compute S matrix elements directly only if the mass renormalization is not there. Okay, only if the physical mass square and the tree level mass squares are the same, but not otherwise. Okay. And if we directly want to compute the renormalized masses and the general S matrix elements in string theory, we do need the analog of shell Green's function. Okay. So that we can just directly apply this formula. Here is the second reason why we want to construct off shell Green's function. And this is that the restriction to on-shell formalism prevents us from shifting vacuum, even in cases where it's within the reach of perturbation theory. Okay. And here is a simple example, okay, which I studied in the late 80s, but it was never really resolved completely. Okay. So it's known that in many compactifications of exothetic to heterotic string theory on Calabio three-folds, one loop correction generates a file opulous term, okay, essentially for a U1 gauge field. And the net effect of this file opulous term is to generate a potential for a charge scalar phi of the following form. Okay. Here C and K are positive constants and G is the string coupling. Now if you look at this form, it's clear that there is a nearby supersymmetric minimum. So phi equal to zero was a perturbative vacuum. Okay. But the supersymmetric minimum is not at phi equal to zero, but at phi equal to G root K. Okay. So if you are doing a normal quantum field theory, all you will do is to shift phi to k root g and do a perturbation expansion around that point. But on-shell techniques in string theory do not tell us how to carry out a systematic perturbation expansion around a new vacuum. 
Okay. So even in the simple cases where you know that there is a supersymmetric vacuum nearby, we don't know how to carry out perturbation theory around this new vacuum. Okay. And again, an official formalism surely would help in this case. So how do we proceed? Okay, there have been many indirect approaches to this problem, which was discussed in the past. Okay. The vacuum shift has been discussed by Fisler, Saskine, and various other people. Mass renormalization has also been discussed. Okay. The direct approach, of course, is to define off-shell Green's function. Okay, and we can think of two roots. One is string field theory. Okay. Here, there have been many attempts, but really has not been much progress beyond tree level or beyond bosonic string theory. Okay, bosonic string theory has been discussed also at the loop level. But there's a more pragmatic approach that one can think of, okay, which is to simply generalize Polyaka prescription without worrying about any field, string field theory origin. Okay. And this is the approach we'll try to take. Okay. Now, string field theory may be needed to act, address big issues like finding non perturbative vacuum. Okay, and one uh, clear example of this is the uh, tachyon condensation in open string field theory. Okay. Tachyon vacuum is very far from the perturbative vacuum, and there we really need a string field theory. Okay. However, the pragmatic approach, which is to simply generalize polyaka prescription to off shell amplitudes, should be sufficient to address issues within perturbative domain. Okay. If you are just interested in defining perturbative off shell string amplitudes and issues of mass renormalization or shifting vacuum, which is a small shift then we should be able to work with this pragmatic approach. Okay, and this is the approach that will follow. Okay. Now again, there have been many approaches to uh, this. Okay, in the previous slide, I listed various uh, references. Okay. The main problem with these approaches is that we, uh, the off cell amplitude that we define this way depends on the choice of the wall sheet metric. So you lose conformal invariance. Okay, and so in a sense, you don't know what you are doing. Okay, unless you are very careful. Okay. Now, in one of these approaches, okay, one defines an on an endpoint genus G amplitude by choosing some holomorphic local coordinates on the wall sheet around each of the end punctures. Okay, this is equivalent to choosing appropriate metric around each of the end punctures where you insert the vortex operators. Okay. And official vortex operators will have to be introduced using these local coordinates. As I said, the problem with this approach is that off-shell amplitudes computed this way depend on the choice of local coordinates and hence are ambiguous. Okay, if you change the local coordinates, your definition of off-shell amplitudes will change. Now, this is potentially problematic, but if one thinks about it a little bit, okay, one realizes that perhaps it's not such a bad thing after all. Because this is not very different from in the situation in a gauge theory where off shell Green's functions of charged fields are gauge dependent. Okay, in a gauge theory, if we try to cal calculate, for example, the electron off shell Green's function in quantum electrodynamics, it's a gauge dependent object. Okay. Nevertheless, one knows how to extract physical quantities out of this. Okay. In particular, the renormalized mass and the S matrix elements computed from these are gauge invariant. And one might ask, can the story be similar in string theory? Okay, perhaps the off-shell amplitudes are dependent on the choice of local coordinates, but maybe the physical quantities will be independent of the choice of local coordinates. So this is the general goal. So let me now describe the progress that we have made so far. Okay, and this is based on the paper that I mentioned and some work in progress. So as I said, if defining the off-shell amplitudes requires choice of a local coordinate system. Okay. But we'll impose a little more restriction on the kind of local coordinate system that we allow. Okay, and this is motivated by string field theory, although we don't really need any underlying string field theory for uh, doing this. Okay. So this extra condition can be called gluing compatibility. Okay. And this is what it means. Okay. So let's consider a genus G1 M punctured Riemann surface, which is glued to a genus G2 N punctured Riemann surface by the plumbing fixture, usual plumbing fixture procedure, okay, where we take the local coordinates, W1 on the first Riemann surface and W2 on the second Riemann surface around the appropriate punctures and identify them by a relation of this form. Okay. And as is well known, this gluing procedure generates a family of genus G1 plus G2 Riemann surface with M plus N minus two punctures. Okay. 
Now, if the initial choice of Riemann surfaces were equipped with local coordinate system around each puncture, okay, then the glued Riemann surface will automatically come with a local coordinate system that is induced from this construction. Okay. And so what we demand is that the choice of local coordinates at the punctures of this genus G1 plus G2 Riemann surface must agree with the one that is induced from the local coordinates at the punctures of the original Riemann surfaces. Okay. So in a sense, we are putting a restriction on the choice of higher genus Riemann surfaces, choice of local coordinates on the higher genus Riemann surface, to the choice of local coordinates on a lower genus surface. Now the advantage of doing this is that once we make this choice, we can divide the contributions to off-shell Green's functions into one particle reducible and one particle irreducible contributions. Okay. Essentially, any Riemann surface that you can get by gluing lower genus Riemann surfaces, we declare them as one particle reducible contributions. Okay? And only those Riemann surfaces that you cannot obtain by gluing lower genus Riemann surfaces are declared as one particle irreducible. Okay? And then what one finds is that they satisfy exactly the same kind of relations that we have in any usual quantum field theory. Okay? So this allows us to define, for example, renormalized mass, S matrix elements, et cetera, in the standard fashion. And now the big question is, are they independent of the choice of local coordinates? Okay, Green's function certainly depends on a choice of local coordinates, but could it be that renormalized mass and S matrix elements that we get from here are independent of the choice of local coordinates? And what we have been able to show so far is that for a special class of states, the physical masses and the S matrix elements that we can compute from these are independent of the choice of local coordinates to all orders in Potter version theory. Maybe I can say a few words about what we mean by spatial class of states in the theory. Okay. Essentially, in string theory, the problem of off-shell continuation is twofold. One is that you have to first go off-shell. You have to take k square away from the three-level mass square. But the other problem is that at a, any given mass level, okay, there are a high level of degeneracy. Okay. And many of the states that appear at a given mass level are not even physical states. Okay. But once you do perturbation theory, the physical and unphysical states start mixing, okay? and you have to do to degenerate perturbation theory. Okay. And so the spatial class of states are those okay, which are pre uh, prevented from mixing with unphysical states by some symmetry. Okay. There are lots of such states in string theory. For example, the, all the states on leading le uh, regi trajectory one can show are such spatial states. Okay. So for these states, we can show that the physical masses and S-matrix elements are indeed independent or the choice of local coordinates. Okay. Now, I believe that this is only a technical restriction. Okay, it should be possible to show this for all states. Okay. But at the same time, the off-shell Green's functions themselves and the wave function normalization factors do depend on the choice of local coordinates. Okay, so it's slightly non-trivial that nevertheless, the locations of the poles and the S matrix elements are independent of the choice of local coordinates. So here is the plan for the future. Okay. So the immediate goal, of course, will be to generalize this to all states in all string theories. Okay. This, we believe, should be possible in not too far future. Okay. A slightly longer term goal, goal will be to use this formalism to study small shifts in the vacuum induced by perturbation theory. Okay. This is, for example, the example that I mentioned, the phi Lopoulos D term. Okay. It's clear that there is a nearby supersymmetric vacuum. Okay, and it seems very plausible that using this off-shell formalism, one can give a completely well-defined string perturbation theory to all orders okay, around the new vacuum. But the main uh, uh, motivation, of course, is that as you understand this off-shell formalism better, perhaps other possible applications are, will crop up. Okay, and this is presumably, uh, I mean, we don't even know what these applications might be. And finally, I'll end by mentioning a related goal, okay, which in fact I have discussed in other forums, so I just mentioned it here. Okay. That eventually, of course, the part of string perturbation theory only can give you limited information. Okay. But one hopes that by combining these perturbative results with S duality and suitable interpolation methods, one can compute physical quantities at finite values of string coupling, where no other method is currently available. Okay, I'll stop here. Thank you. There's another procedure to account for mass renormalization. I wonder whether it gives you the same answer as yours. 
So imagine we are saying ten, flat 10-dimensional space. The massless states remain massless. And then we can just scatter them without worrying about this issue and tune the parameters such that in intermediate states, we have the massive states, but then the calculation is really done completely on shell, and then we can ex factorize on the masses, on the, sh on the shifted points, masses. Yeah. yeah. So this procedure is manifestly correct, because you never go off shell. So my question is whether your procedure reproduces the answers obtained with the other one. Okay. Yeah. So first of all, this procedure works only in, uh, uh, doesn't work for all cases. Okay. Because we know, for example, that in uh, SO32 heterotic string theory, there are SO32 spinners, which are massive. Right, and they'll never be produced in the scattering of massless states. So for those, you do need an if different formalism. For those cases where the, uh, the massive states in consideration are, appear as intermediate states, okay, this procedure gives exactly the same result. Okay, so you can show that if you start with a massive massless uh, scattering and factorize, okay, this procedure will give exactly the same results. One second. Do you intend to use this procedure just to study stable particles, or are you also interested in the widths of unstable particles? In principle, this can be used to study widths of un uh, unstable particles also. But as Nati just mentioned, that some, in some of these cases, the unstable, if the unstable particles decay into just massless particles, you could, in principle, use the other procedure of factorizing onto uh, uh, the poles. But this procedure can also be used. Okay? This is universal, that this can be used in principle both for stable particles, which you cannot get from uh, in the scattering of massless particles, and also for unstable particles. I actually don't understand the question. What does it mean to scatter? What, what does it mean to be unstable Yeah, I think you can go, you can uh, continue the momentum to complex plane and be on the pole. Right? Not yeah, that's not an S matrix, that's right. But it's a, it's a residue. I mean, you can think of this as this S matrix as what you will get as a, in the residue of uh, scattering of massless particles. So one connection with gauge theory, uh, we know that we can certainly compute things off-shell in gauge theory. And so that would first suggest that off-shell open string should certainly be possible in some form. At least that's a very uh, natural suggestion. On the other hand, for closed strings, the ADS-CFT might suggest another, that that should not be possible, perhaps, because that would suggest that you will have an extra variable on the gauge theory side, which we don't know how to interpret. So the on-shell closed string with off-shell open string kind of thing uh, is, is one of the ingredients of ADS-CFT. And if you are going to off-shell on closed string side, then you're going to have one extra variable. What do you interpret that extra variable as? I think the point is the off-shell in closed string, it's gauge dependent, right? So the real question is whether the gauge independent quantities, okay, that we have more gauge independent quantities from the off-shell formalism than what we expect. And that I don't think is the case, right? For example, even in closed, if you have a closed string theory in flat space, okay, the masses of particles are physical, right? And those you should be able to compute. And one of the ways to compute this will be to use this off-shell formalism, right? So, I mean, so what I'm saying is that the, not every, all the information in this off-shell amplitudes are gauge invariant. Well, off-shell amplitude, okay. On gauge theory side, the physical quantities are off-shell amplitudes of gauge invariant quantities. But there are a lot of other off-shell quantities you can compute which are gauge dependent. Right? So can we do anything analogous with closed string? So there should not be any gauge invariant questions. Yeah, there are probably no gauge invariant questions on the closed string side, except, the, except things like masses of physical particles and S matrix elements. Ashok, is, is it possible to either justify this or avoid it altogether by working in a light cone gauge? Or in particular, is it possible to justify this procedure by working in a light cone gauge where you have a genuine Hamiltonian and uh, a Schrodinger equation and where everything should be well defined? Justify. Well, one way to justify this procedure is that, as what Nati mentioned, that in cases where the same mass can be obtained in, uh, also from factorization of uh, scattering of massless states, about the cases where you can't do, uh, where that uh, doesn't work. I see. Where you can justify it using light cone gauge, I don't know. It's po it may be possible. Yeah, I haven't thought about this. I, I'm more thinking here purely in the covariant language. What is the problem with contact terms? Because you use the microphone for that? I suppose you do. Yeah, so the, all, all these subtleties are going to hit you with the, where is my Have any 
questions? Any more?